Okay, well, this morning uh, we are continuing on with a two-week series that I've called A Love Story in the Midst of War. It's a scan of the Bible. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time sort of scanning the two stories, the war story and the love story last time. We talked first about the war story, and there were two major assaults that Satan has against God. Remember, the war is not about us. The war is between Satan and God, and, and we simply were created in the middle of it. And, and God is carrying out his love story on us in the middle of a war story that he has going on with Satan. We talked about two major assaults that Satan has made against mankind in the middle of this war. The first one was Genesis 6. It was when the fallen angels came and somehow cohabitated with women and they created this master race, if you will, called the Nephilim. They were giants. And, and, and people all over the earth have these have these legends that trace back to the, both the giants and the floods. So even secular historians know, okay, some point in time, there were giants on earth and there was a flood. So we looked at that. That was the first assault on mankind by Satan, major assault to try and destroy humanity. Secondly, we looked at Genesis 11, this guy named Nimrod who built the Tower of Babel, and somehow it was this occultish uh, uh, structure that 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 and in some way, he got hidden knowledge from the occult. And then he did the same thing. He created Nephilim again. And God, God stopped that uh, very quickly um, in Babel. But, but so we looked at the war story and these major assaults that Satan has made against man mankind written about in the Bible. And then we looked at the love story. The story that we are in, God's faithfulness, constant faithfulness, that, and his determination that mankind will inherit the earth, mankind will rule over creation, mankind will be loved by God no matter what Satan might try to do. And that love played out. It played out with the first reset from the Nephilim. It played out with the flood when he drowns all of those creepy giant creatures, those giants. It played out in the second reset at Babel when he changed languages so that they were dispersed. And whatever technology and whatever occultic practices they were doing were dispersed and lost, lost in history. That was God's love played out in history. And then he selects the Jews. He selects the Jews and God pours out his love onto the Jews and pours out his love through the Jews to be a blessing to the entire world. And that, that went on for 2,000 years. And the Old Testament is written as the love story between God and the Jews and vicariously us who are grafted in to the Jewish vine. And after that, then the, then the Jews reject their Messiah and at Pentecost, God makes it clear, okay, you are still my chosen people, you Jewish people. You're still my chosen. I still have a future for you. But right now, I'm not talking to you. And at Pentecost, he used every other language to speak to the world, but he stopped speaking in Hebrew, clearly signaling that I'm just setting you aside. I still love you. You're still my chosen people. I will still guard you and protect you. But we're not talking right now. So then in comes the church, and God pours his love out on the church, and he pours his love through the church to, to reach the world as salt and light. And, and that's us. We're, we're in that age now. That is the time in history that we live. And this morning, we're going to look at some things of prophecy, some things that are in the future. That, that can be interpreted from the Bible. And, and it comes from a point of view, I will tell you this. There's several points of view, especially when you're talking about prophecy. There's all these major points of views. I've looked at them all. I, I have landed in a spot, and I've landed in a spot that I, I can tell you that four of our elders agree with me, and, and there are seven elders. There are three elders that I actually don't know, and the reason I don't know is because nobody's going to fight and die over this, but there are differing views, just to kind of put that disclaimer out there. But I am teaching from a point of view that, that I find in Scripture and that I have become convinced of. And yes, so we will move on with what I think the future for, uh, has for us. Jesus said to the church, he said, look, when it comes to the time of the end, when it comes to the wrapping up of history, there will be birth pangs. There will be signs of the times. There will be some indicators for the church at that point in time to go, ah, this might be the wrapping up. This might be that final seven years that has been prophesied where God begins to work through the Jews again. So, so we're going to look at some of that. And we're going to ask this question this morning. Are we seeing signs of the times? I think 
I think everybody, everybody in our culture is kind of going, what is going on? I mean, things have changed so fast in our world. And most of us are kind of just like, what is happening? And, and to that point, does the Bible say anything about what is happening right now? We're going to look at that this morning. And I've studied this sort of end times thing for probably 30 years. Every once in a while, probably maybe every two years, I'll look at it again, and I'll look at current events, and I'll look at the prophecies. And I mean, it's just something I've done. Um, and most of the time, because I've told you before, I have this atheist background, which makes me a very skeptical person. So I've mostly looked at everything with a very skeptical eye. And, you know, books are written, well, it's the end is near, the end is near. And most of the time, I'm like, eh, I don't think so. Or I can't tell. So there are a couple of interesting things I want to share with you that this morning that they're interesting, um, and, and we'll decide if they seem compelling or not. First of all, Jesus says that at the time of the end, there will be certain indications and those indicators are listed in this way. There will be wars and reports of wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilence. Oh, actually, that tells me nothing about the end because there's been that for all of time. So I don't, Jesus is not helping me on this topic. So then there are other things in prophecy where you go to go, oh, well, that's interesting. One of the most interesting things in prophecy that has happened in current history is the return of the Jews into their land. That is probably the most interesting fact. And that actually has been prophesied for thousands of years. The Jews were given the land as part of the promise to Abraham. It was not conditional. It wasn't, if you behave, you get the land. No, it was given to them forever. And there was a caveat. It was, if you disobey me, I'll take it away as a punishment, but it's still yours. I mean, it's like I'll send you to your room for a little while, but then you can come back. So in, in, uh, on May 14th, 1948, the Jews actually re-entered their land, and they had been gone since about 600 B.C., and that's actually, you have to put a few prophecies together, but actually you can go from day to day. I mean, to the day, you can take Bible prophecy and come to May 14th, 1948. It's a shocking, it's a shocking prophetic fulfillment. Many people have said, ah, we're at the end. They're back. I'm sorry, the skeptic is not convinced. They're back. That is significant. They have to be back for the seven years of tribulation to work. They must be in the land. They could be there a thousand years. And some people use generation, they use certain words about generation. I just, to, to not get into too much detail, I'm just not convinced. They are there. It is really significant. I will tell you something about Bible prophecy, prophecy that's all really significant is there's tons of prophecy fulfilled in Jesus. And about in 32 AD, he dies, and prophecy pretty much goes silent. I mean, you can point to any time after 32 AD, and you kind of go, okay, well, I don't see any fulfillment anywhere, anywhere. Not even in the church, because the church was a surprise. We talked about it last time. Until you come to 1948. And that's an astounding prophetic fulfillment. And then, the, then it's an astounding fulfillment. Actually, in the last 75 years, there's been, prophe- there's been tons of prophecies that are foretold in the Scripture that have happened related to the Jews. So it, it is a big deal. I'm just not saying, oh my gosh, the end is here. I, I, can't, I can't get there. So the next thing, which is a picture up there, a very creepy looking picture. Um, this, is, uh, this is a statue that appeared two years ago in front of the United Nations. And <laughs> you'll love this. That thing is called the Guardian of Peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think of peace when I think of that thing. And I, and I will tell you that, that what is incredibly creepy about this thing is that it fits the prophecies of Revelations and Daniel about the Antichrist. So let me read you what it says. I'm reading from Revelations 13.2. And actually, I know you're going to go there. Could you go back to the slide? Because I want to point to the picture. I kind of messed up on the slide. So just keep it there for a second. So let me read to you Revelations 13.2. It says, And the beast, speaking of the Antichrist, which I saw was like a leopard. Okay, look at the body of that thing. It actually, I don't know if you can see, it has spots on it like a leopard. The head is very much like a leopard. So in general, the beast looks like a leopard. Yep, check. Uh, and it says, but the, the feet of this thing are bear claws. You know, leopards have paws. And I don't know if you can see it clearly, but those are bear claws. Those are bear claws. 
And the feet are like those of bear claws. And then the mouth is that of the lion. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's true. That's, that's the mouth of the lion. And then you, that's in Revelation. And then you look in Daniel. And Daniel acts, adds a few other attributes. Namely, he has wings. So when you take the two prophecies together, you kind of go, that's the mark. That is a symbol of Antichrist. In terms of the Bible, you kind of go, how is that in front of the UN? So people are freaking out about this. This is the time of the end. That's the sign of the Antichrist. It's like... Okay, all right, could be. But the skeptic comes in and says, you know what? Artwork sits in front of buildings sometimes for 500 years. You can go to Europe, you can see gargoyles on top of buildings. They're ugly little things, and they've been there for hundreds of years. That doesn't convince me. That's significant. I will tell you this, what I believe about that. I believe that both John in writing the book of Revelation and Daniel, I believe God fast forwarded them in in history to see some of the things they saw of the times of the end. And I think they did see that thing. But it still doesn't tell you it's now. It could be there for a very, very, very long time. So the, the other thing is, if you read these books, if you listen to people who are really into this, they, they keep referring to technology. And because I've been kind of following this for 30 years, I mean, they've been saying oh, the new technology comes in. Oh, my gosh, that's the mark of the beast. That's that's the system of Antichrist. And, and it, the most funniest one for me is when we started to use, I date myself, we started to use credit cards at grocery stores. Believe it or not, some of you younger realize we used to actually write checks for our groceries. And then they went to credit cards and Christians were like, oh, my God. Gosh, it's the beast. And, and it was like, ah, uh, I think it's just convenient, actually. I'm not sure that it's the mark of the beast. So I've been, I've been resistant to say that any tech is, is somehow pointing to Antichrist. There have been a lot of these kinds of things. Um, however, today, there's two things that, that I can't quite apply my skepticism to. And, and it, it's not conclusive, but I want to share those with you today. Today, uh, there's a couple of things that are weird. One is um, the Antichrist becomes part of a one-world government. And so it's, it has some dates to it now. It, it's, it's really been trying to happen for 100 years. The world has been talking about coming together as one world, which, by the way, is a reversal of Babel. Of Babel. Remember, God said, this is bad. This is bad that the world is all together because he says there was nothing they will not be able to do. And you kind of think, well, wow, that sounds like they'll cure cancer. No, it's bad not because they'll do great things, but it's bad because humans are fallen and we're broken. And we're also in the middle of an evil war that we're getting influenced by that war. So this is not a good thing. So for 100 years, the League of Nations, the United Nations, there's been this attempt to try and put the world together as one. And, and today... It's gotten a little. It's gotten a little closer in, in sort of a very quick way. There's this thing called the World Economic Forum. You can read about it. Most people don't know about it. It's actually a collection. We first started out in the '70s as a collection of a whole bunch of rich men who got together and they just, you know, thought, you know, they theorized what mankind should do. Here's the plan for the Earth. You know, here's the here's what the whole Earth should do. Well. Over time, it has been a collection of very, very wealthy industrials, people who control economic power, and politicians like our President Biden is part of the World Economic Forum. And the World Economic Forum now, it, it consists of, you put that together with China has its own version of it, that they, they cooperate and they say the same things. So you put this thing together and you actually realize, wow, this has about 90% of the economic control of the earth these people have. And they have about 90% of the political power of the earth, the people that are part of this. And they say that by 2030, the world will come together as one political and one economic unity. That's what they say. Who knows? I mean, if they said it in 1970, a bunch of rich men sitting, sitting around saying that, it's like, ah, whatever. You know, I have to work. You can say stuff like that. You can get together. But, but it's not that way anymore. This is, this is the people who could actually pull it off. So I, it's kind of like, okay, I really want to be skeptical because I've tried to be skeptical for 30 years. I kind of go, no, that sounds like you're really trying to revert, reverse Babel. And you have the will to do that. And you have the desire to do that. And you have the power to do that. So I kind of go, hmm, all right. There's another thing that's, that's a second thing that I kind of go, okay, I don't know that I can be skeptical of this. That is what's happening in science, in biotechnology, and even DNA research. 
The so secular scientists who, who function in those realms, they claim that the end of humanity, the end of the human era, will be 2045. That by 2045, that's 22 years away, every single human on the planet will be human and something else. That it will be the new evolution and, and they're saying this because of technology and things that we know now. They, they believe that the new human, the new evolution in humanity will be, be integrating computer science into humans. Like apparently this company by Elon Musk just got approval to insert a chip into a human brain. And this is, this is what they believe. That it's an integration of human, human beings and technology. So computers with, tech, with, with human beings, robotics merged with human beings, and, and DNA. I mean, they're really figuring out DNA. They really, really are. They're figuring out the building blocks of DNA and finding out, well, why does it deteriorate? Why is it that as a kid you can fight diseases and when you're elderly you can't? Um, they're, they're, the whole goal of this is immortality. It, it is trying to elongate the human life, which on basis, again, it's like Babel. I mean, there's nothing they will not be able to do. It's, it sounds good on the, on the foundation of it. And, and potentially, it is great. And, and we as people of Earth right now may benefit tremendously from this. I mean, they may cure diseases. They, they likely will cure diseases that have plagued humanity for hundreds and maybe thousands of years. They will, they will potentially end paralysis. I've seen videos of people who have, in, in war, their part of their arm is gone, and they put prosthetics on it and, and robotic arms that actually move and, and move based upon brain waves, based upon what the brain is doing. It's phenomenal. They're going to slow down aging is what they say, and maybe even eliminate it. The goal is immortality. So, so by and large, it's like, it's good. It's good. Same with the world globalism. It sounds good. I mean, we've got to worry about global warming, and we've got to work together for famines and, and pandemics. So realize that the reasoning of man is always good and always sensible. But we know something else that, that we have seen through history that God tells us about, about the nature of humankind. Can we handle what we do? You see, on the dark side of all this, we know that the fallen angels, as a part of a strategy to eliminate humankind, they made the Nephilim, which were superhumans. That, that could have been great. They could have helped humans build buildings and, and, and harvest crops, but no, they ended up just trying to destroy humanity. And Nimrod tried the same thing. And now we actually have the technology to make the Nephilim. We actually have the technology to make something that is more powerful and bigger than us. And, and I don't know if you guys have been watching the news and listening to this new thing called artificial intelligence, AI. If you want to be entertained, listen to what Elon Musk says about it. I mean, one of the creators of this says, oh yeah, this could take out humans. Oh yeah, this could take over. It's like, thank you. Thank you for making something that could then do us in. It's, it, we live in a crazy time. So at this point in time, you're saying, why did I come to church today? <laughs> <laughs> This is horrific. First, this guy told us these creepy stories about giants last time. Now he's scaring us to death. I'm not meaning to do that. Jesus said, actually, we as a church, we're supposed to know the signs of the time. And he also says something else. We're supposed to be not afraid. Well, I, I mean, I've kind of told you some scary stuff today. How can I not be afraid? Because it's not our story. It's not our story. This is what the war story does. This is what humans do without love, without God's love. It is not our story. We are part of the love story. And God's constant faithfulness is that mankind will inherit the earth. Mankind will rule over creation. Mankind will be loved no matter what. Thank you for that. Amen. So when I was sharing some of this with some Christian friends, we get to this point and I go, yeah, but you know, also when it is the worst of the worst, whatever that is, whatever the end is, is we won't even be here. And I can just see the Christian friends that go, Phew, okay. And they kind of stop listening. So if I'm really scaring you this morning and I haven't relieved your fear, take your two fingers and stick them in your ear and go, la, 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 la. 
I promise you, though, I'm not going to scare you anymore because the rest is about the love story. It's about the story we're actually in. We're supposed to know the times, signs of the times, but we know that we're not part of them, and we know that we have power over them, and we know that we have a God who will not let his, his story be diverted. So what do we do? If this is true, what do we do? It looks like if mankind can create its own Nephilim again, we know what God will do in time and may not be that much time. He'll have to reset. He reset twice before. When, when on the earth there was something that threatened humankind, he reset. He, he did this horrific, dramatic thing to drown all the Nephilim. Actually, Babel was pretty easy. It was just, well, let me just mix their languages up and they'll, they'll go back, they'll, they'll lose their technology. So God has the ability to do a very gentle reset, and we'll talk a little bit more of that, that in a few minutes. But what do we do? Well, we do what we've always done. We make disciples. This is what the church is. We are salt and light. We are here to hold this back. And we do that by the gospel. We believe that we bring people to Christ through the love of Christ, and we reach them through discipleship. And I think most critical now is the gospel itself. Our message is very much under attack. And, and if you talk to pretty much anybody on the street, they will give you a version of the gospel that is not the gospel at all. So one of the things we have to do, I believe, is be very, very clear on the gospel, the dramatic gospel that it is. I think if you ask somebody on the street now, well, what is, what is the Christian gospel? Well, it's judgmental. It's religious. It's condemning. No, the true gospel is radical. It's radical in its love. It's revolutionary. So we know the highlights. Jesus died for your sins. And if you want to go to heaven, you need to receive his payment for your sins. That's the highlight. Well, they have a highlight about the gospel. You can talk to anybody on the street. They will pretty much say this to you. The church calls everyone sinners and they hate people's freedom and what they do with that freedom. That's pretty much the gospel that people have believed. Actually, in the term of today, the gospel is somewhat of hate speech because it's judgmental and critical and stealing freedom. So, so let's do a re 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 recollecting of what the gospel is and the power of the gospel love. On this issue of sin, Romans 5.20 says, The law came in so the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. This is actually an outrageous statement. This is outrageous. What this actually says is that the more you sin, the more God pours out his love on you. Now, I would, I would think the opposite, but that's, uh, this is what this says. The more you sin, grace abounds all the more. Grace is unmerited favor. It's something you don't deserve. So God, God, you don't deserve his love even before you sin, but when you sin, you certainly don't deserve more of his love. But that's the gospel. That's the outrageous part of the gospel. Actually, when you sin, more love is poured upon you. You could legitimately come to the statement that says, who is the most loved person in any church? It's the one with the most sins. And, and I know our evangelical minds are going, Zzz. we're going, wait a minute, he didn't just say that. No, I, I did. And I'm actually just quoting Paul. That's actually, that's actually what it says. The gospel is outrageous in its love. It is outrageous. It is so radical. It's scandalous in its freedom and love for us. Now, if you're listening, you know, part of your objection is going to, well, if I really go with that, then I'll be promoting sin. I'll be saying more sin equals more love. Well, actually, Paul is right ahead of you on that. In, a, in the next few verses in Romans 6, 1 and 2, he says, well, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live it any, in, in it anymore? He moves quickly off the issue of sin and says it's really about who you are and that who you are is going to be loved whether or not you sin, this is the love story. You will be loved. That's God's story, and that's the story we're part of. And he will not waver from that. I could spend time going into all the theology of this, which I don't have time for this morning, but Paul knows, and this is why he says it, that it is actually the tender love of God that moves you to Christ-likeness. Look what he says in Titus 2. He says, verses 11 through 12, he says, For the grace of God shines upon us, bringing salvation to all men, training us, training us, 
sharpening us, training us to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensible, righteously, godly lives in the present age. So what is doing that? What is training us? The grace of God, the undeserved love of God actually trains us. See, we're supposed to go to God when we sin, and instead of hiding in shame, which we think works, and, and hiding from God, we're actually supposed to God be, go to God because God is actually concerned for us when we sin, and he's not concerned for us that he, we're going down a rabbit hole. He's concerned that we haven't, we haven't understood the love. We, we clearly need more love. Titus is telling us that, 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 it, that it melts us, this, this dynamic, this outrageous story, this outrageous gospel. It actually molds us. It is the love of God that changes us. It does not condemn us. It melts us. You know, the image that helps drive this home for me is the temple complex. And, and, and when Jesus died, the temple, the second temple was there. And, and it had this curtain, excuse me had this curtain that separated the holy of holies, which is the holiest place on earth. It is, it is the place where God dwells. It is his throne room, if you will. And there was this very thick curtain that separated that from the rest of the temple, from the rest of humanity. And then the message in that is that because of sin, we do not have access to God. We cannot be close to God. And at the moment of crucifixion, when Jesus said, it is finished, it says that the, that, that curtain is ripped top to bottom, just ripped open. And Hebrews 4 makes it clear that it says that what that meant was we now have access to the throne room of God. We have access and closeness with the Father that we have not had since Adam because that was closed off at Adam. So we have this tremendous access that for thousands of years of Jewish history, they had no access and they knew it. Well, that's not really the whole story. I mean, we tend to look at these stories from our point of view. That is true. We, we have, we have um, empathy for Adam and Eve who lost the closeness with God. They lost their connection with God. But there's another side to the story. Actually, we lost. We lost God in the fall, but God lost us. I mean, he actually lost connection with us. So God lost at that moment. And for thousands of years, God was losing. God lost connection with the ones he has made in his own image. So at the cross, it's the final victory. And it rips the curtain because it, because it changes God's loss into a win. So you see, when, that, when Jesus declared, it is finished, God didn't wait a minute. He didn't wait a second. When the payment was made, that very second that Jesus got, died, the father rips the curtain and says, I cannot wait a single minute longer. I've waited thousands of years. I cannot wait a single minute more to get to those ones that I love. And realize when it was. It was at the worst moment in human history. They just killed his son. You realize it tells you what his longing is, what he wanted. He wasn't going to wait another instant, regardless of sin, regardless of what we did. He could not wait to love us. Well, you see, that's what he does when we sin. He can't wait. He needs to get to us. He needs to, he needs to pour more love on us because there's something about who we are we are not understanding. And what do we really need? Do we need shame in that moment? No, we need love. We need to know. We need to know we're still loved. That's the gospel. It's outrageous. And if it doesn't bring tears to you, then you're really not understanding it. The outrageous gospel is a heart-melting experience. And it's unfortunately completely lost and distorted by the world's version of the gospel. You know, this became, this became very clear to me when I was debating atheists online. And, and they, they always bring up the latest topic, but the latest topic that is still the latest topic, um, which would always come at me, well, you're a Christian, so that means that you hate gays and transgender. And I say, actually, no. That is not the Christian doctrine. That's not how I feel. And because I'm an edgy person, I turn it around quickly and say, no, actually, that's what you do. You actually hate them. 
Your philosophy actually hates gays and genders because you are an evolutionist. You think that man got here through evolution, which means the survival of the fittest, which says, if you cannot pass your DNA onto the next generation, then your DNA is faulty and wrong and must die and rot in the ground. So, gays and transgenders, therefore, according to the world's philosophy, are hated. They are not fit to pass their DNA on. That's their philosophy. That's not Christian philosophy. That's theirs. They believe that nature has decided that those categories of people are not fit to pass their DNA on, and they must die in this generation. Well, if you want to see an atheist run for the hills, you tell them this. Because they know it's true. And they know they can't crumble the survival of the fittest because the entire evolutionary theory then crumbles at their feet and it doesn't work. Well, the gospel contrastingly says, all people, no matter what your proclivity is, we are made in the image of God. We bear the attributes of God himself. This means that you and I are a reflection of almighty God. We are like God. And you alone, you are a particular facet of God's image. Every human being is a particular attribute of God. And out of 8 billion images of God, you are completely unique. And God found it so important that you and every 8 billion other people be here to reflect God's image. That it was so important for you to reflect God's image, that's why you are here because earth would not be the same without you here. That's the gospel. That's the gospel for everyone, no matter what proclivity and sexual orientation you have. That is the gospel. The follow-up with atheists, if they don't run away, is, yeah, but you say homosexuality and transgender is sinful. Well, actually, that's a half-truth. And every half-truth is a complete lie. And I'll give you a great example. The first half-truth that was a complete lie was in the garden. Satan said to Eve, he said, well, you know, if you eat of that fruit, you'll know good and evil, and then you'll be like God. Well, half-truth was she would know good and evil, but she wouldn't be like God. No, actually, she was going to be like Satan, because what Satan knew, Satan knew good and evil too, but Satan had become evil. That's how he knew good and evil. And he got Eve to do the exact same thing. You will become evil, and therefore you will know good good and evil. So, half truth and a complete lie. And that's what that is. And we as a church, church people, we have to be more aggressive with the world when they say that. Well, you say this is sinful. The entire gospel says this. Yes, gay and transgender and many of those letters in the LGBTQ, is, we can, the Bible considers sin. And what does the Bible do? The Bible says that God took all sins, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He took all sins and he nailed them to the cross. Nailed them. They are dead. Sin is a dead issue. It has been nailed to the cross. Nobody goes to heaven or hell because of sins at all. So when anybody comes at you and says, well, you say it's sin, you say, it's dead. I don't talk about dead stuff. I'm not talking about dead things. Stop saying that. That is not the gospel. The gospel said there are sins and we all have sinned and it's all done away with and it's not the issue any longer. That's the gospel. And the beauty of it, that is the beauty of it that we are actually free from that entire topic. Well, again, if they still are there and they still want to press it, they'll say, yeah, but what if your church has some LGBTQ and whatever else comes to your church and they decide to remain in their sins? What is that? Well, the gospel says they might just be the most loved. That's the gospel. That is the outrageous gospel. It is outrageous. It is so radical. And it is so heart-melting to us and to everyone. God's outrageous, scandalous love story, it will prevail. And humans will be loved. God will not be stopped not by any power of the universe, not by Satan, not by creepy Nephilim, 
not by the, by the distorted gospel, not even by our own sins, God will not be stopped in his love story for all of us. We live in a crazy time. We live in an astounding time. It's, it's, Dickens said it this way, it is the best of times, it is the worst of times. That's probably applicable to us. We live in a crazy time. And it's hard for me to imagine when you look at their war story, it's hard for me to imagine that God is not going to intervene in some way like the resets of, of old. But what could that be? You know, he can, he can do a very gentle reset. What could that be? Well, let me, position, let me posit this to, to you guys. What if, what if the gospel is the reset What if the church is the reset? What if the power, this kind of power of gospel love is the reset for mankind? What if it's us? You know, something about us, and when we get scared of the time in which we live, you got to realize something. God didn't choose you to be here in 1950 when this was a Christian country and it was easy to be a Christian. He actually chose you and me for right now. That means we're ready. That means we're here. That means we're called to something. And actually, when you read writings of the early church people, they actually looked to this time and said, that would be an amazing time to live. That would be a great time to live. This could be the greatest time for church history right now. And the church has a history of transforming evil empires. Absolutely. When Jesus Christ was crucified, the Roman Empire had its iron grip on people, a stranglehold on its population. And by 305 AD, Christianity is declared the the religion of of the era, the religion of Rome. Rome crumbled at Christianity. The Roman world crumbled. And and if you you know anything about Roman history, Romans hated Christians because, why? Because they saw it as the end of Rome. There's a guy by the name of Pliny, and he looked at Christianity, and atheists had this wrong too. That Christianity was the the first philosophy to even suggest that women ought to have rights. And to even come up with the idea that slaves and masters were equal, and it's all through Christianity. And Romans were scared of it because they said, this is going to be the end of the Roman world. This will be the end of us. And guess what? They were right. It was. Christianity conquered Rome, and we can too. Maybe God has made us the reset. So let's pray. Father, you have placed us in a wild time, Father. And, and we need to, of all times, we need to be straight on the gospel. We need to be close to you, Father. But we need to do what you tell us to do, is not be afraid, Father. This is not our story. We are here to do something for you. We are here to be light and salt. And thank you, Father, for the honor of being here right now, Lord God. Because you have found us worthy. You have found us worthy and you, will, you have and will empower us to be here and now. And we thank you for that, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.